politics, the author of many articles, editor of many books. Uh, but her notoriety, if I can say that, comes from her experience teaching at Wheaton College, an evangelical uh, institution in Illinois, where she taught for nine years, where she was the first uh, African-American woman to receive tenure. And a year ago, uh, Christmas, uh, she wore a hijab in solidarity with Muslim students. It was a protest against Islamophobia, subject of her talk today. This uh, received a lot of media attention, and I assume that everybody in the room has probably heard something about the controversy. Uh, Wheaton uh, put her on administrative leave, and eventually she left the university. Uh, if I, went on, I went online today to look at some of the many, many articles, uh, and when you Google her name, one of the first things that comes up is how uh, she, according to Fox, uh, ex Wheaton professor has resurfaced <laughs> at the University of Virginia. So she's now a <coughs> Abdul Qadir uh, visiting faculty fellow at the University of Virginia, where she's working on a project on Islam and Islamophobia. Uh, I just wanted to point out that, uh, again, many people applauded uh, her action, and uh, Suad Abdul Kabir, who was the speaker on this campus last year, uh, wrote a letter, a very supportive letter, in the Huffington Post uh, supporting her action, uh, Dr. Hawkins' action. Uh, but even more recently, two days ago, the New York Times gave its uh, one of its undergraduate or a student journalism awards to a student who wrote an editorial. Uh, I can find it. The prize winning editorial is Muddying a Sacred Cloth and the Hijab is Worn in Solidarity. I don't know if you've seen this yet. And uh, it's arguing that uh, wearing the hijab is an example of cultural appropriation or misappropriation. And, uh, all I can say as I introduce our speaker is this reminds me of what my mother said, which is if people hate you from the left and from the right, you must be doing something well. <laughs> so let me please kindly uh, join me in, in welcoming uh, Dr. Lavisha Hawkins. Thanks. It's really good to be with you all today. I have been um, on campus for three days now, and it's been a privilege to be among college students in a college community again. Um, at UVA, I'm kind of stuck in an office off of grounds, <laughs> and so, um, and I've actually only recently started there. So it's really a privilege to be back in a university setting and speaking with you. Um, my comments tonight will, um, I don't know if you call it the Oregon State University, but I thought I would, just in case. Um, so you know, football players are playing in games. <laughs> the Oregon State. <laughs> so I just wanted to make that clear that I knew that you were the one. So. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about this topic um, in part because uh, while my wearing of the hijab and solidarity with Muslim women um, has become uh, a part of my story, which is a long journey, um, a long spiritual journey, also a long journey that includes um, waking up every day um, and resolving to quote in, in the words of a prayer from the Book of Common Prayer, make no peace with oppression. Um, that's the goal of my life and it was the focus of my teaching because I'm a political scientist and government is ultimately about doing justice. And as long as there's injustice in the world, we all have a job to do, whether at the level of government, civil society, business, uh, what have you. And so the overarching focus of everything I do, and even of my religious journey, has been a journey towards the prophetic books of scripture, um, a journey towards understanding that you know righteousness always has to be coupled with justice. They're not twin pursuits, they're not parallel pursuits, they're wedded together in the Torah, and uh, in the New Testament, um, as well. So as one looks at Jesus' life and teaching, his life and teaching, his ministry, um, is geared towards walking with the oppressed, those who need justice. 
and the call of the Christian for the prophetic books, um, the call of uh, the Jew, the faithful um, religious pilgrim, is towards the vulnerable, moving towards the vulnerable so as to walk with them in their oppression, but also calling government and institutions of society to task for the ways that we oppress. So that's what my teaching is about. Um, and broadly speaking, that's what we're in the hijab. The United States is a country riven within. Geopolitical forces at play in the present day may assure our self-destruction from within, and encroaching international problems may solidify our unraveling from without. If you don't believe me, let's look at popular culture. Even Iron Man and Captain America can't agree, so what's a country? <laughs> Politics doesn't occur in a historical vacuum. Yet, the United States of America is one big anachronism after the other. The United States, the city on a hill that's forward-looking, that's entrepreneurial, experimental. But the city on a hill doesn't look back to its past. It looks forward to its future. Thus, we're often doomed to repeat the problems of the past. Uh, scholar Roger Smith says that we have multiple traditions, along with egalitarianism. We practice xenophobia, racism, sexism, genocides, holocaust of our own making. And so, people, in spite of our contradictions, our self-referentially incoherent adherence to our own ideals, our hypocrisy, people are willing to sacrifice, even die, in the United States of America, the imperial cult. Politics and religion have always mixed in the United States. But beyond that, the state is a cult in and of itself. Political scientists talk about something and historians call civil religion. Um, the American imperial cult is replete with symbols, icons, rituals, monuments, prayers, and what those of us who study religion call literature, for those of you who practice. The nation's pastor operates in priestly and prophetic modes. In the priestly mode, the president of the United States blesses the nation. Name one speech where you've heard a president speak where he doesn't say, God bless America. And calling the nation also to its higher ideals, as the prophets do, to overturn injustice. So tell me, I like for people to be interactive, what are some of the rituals of the American cult? The monuments, the things that, the symbols, the things that lead us to sacrifice for something purportedly bigger than ourselves. Uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. Someone over here. Helena. The anthem before sports events. Okay, the national anthem before sporting events. Other things. Talked about some rituals. Other sacred prayers. Journey to D.C. Okay, journeying to D.C., the nation's capital. So lots of high schools have this <coughs> program called Close Up, American Close Up, so that the goal is to get American um, high school students enamored with the seat of government and of power early on. Any other things? <coughs> High holy holidays like Thanksgiving, Fourth of July. So the imperial cult is real. And purportedly, it's our Americanists, our gathering around the flag, our rallying <coughs> around the flag, and performing these rituals, right? that binds us together. But the politics of the American cult are awfully quick to exclude those that we have deemed apostate, impure, or otherwise not worthy of the American imperial cult. And especially zombies. <laughs> so, zombie <coughs> politics, I like to talk about. I love the zombie genre, in case you haven't noticed. My family has an intense, ongoing conversation about which two family members we would include on our team in the coming zombie apocalypse. <laughs> and if you don't believe it's coming, it is. Zombies were once like you, but now infected, they are public enemy number one, dangerous by definition. In a zombie political economy, zombies are rational actors. That is, they're in it to win it, and their market preference is you. They have demand, and your pretty, uninfected face is their supply. You, equally market savvy, prefer to survive. Your approximate market solution? Kill the zombies. 
In the U.S. political context, we have our own zombie political economy. Each morning, kids on the west and south sides of Chicago, the two areas of the city with the highest murder rates, are welcomed to school through a program called Safe Passage. But as they enter the portals into their future, public education is touted as the leveler, leveler of children's playing fields, right? No, they're actually socialized into society's self-fulfilling prophecy born of the <coughs> social imagination. Schools are replete with guards and counselors ready to call the police on six-year-olds. Private prison profiteers project how many penitentiaries to build on the basis of third grade children's reading scores. The American dream, eight-year-old zombies. You don't have to speculate about why the mayor of Chicago doesn't send his kids to his local public school in the city of the Big Shoulders, and the president of the United States, by the way, too, when they lived in Chicago. Once we create political zombies, we apply any number of symbolic metaphors to rationalize why their suffering is their fault, and to rationalize why we are justified in stripping them of citizenship. Here are some of the policy metaphors we use to make them subhuman. We <coughs> animalize them. For welfare policy, there's a famous meme that goes around, don't feed the animals. USDA warning, don't feed the animals in the park, because they'll get addicted. We infantilize them. We mechanize them. The robots, right? We sterilize them. This historical precedent. Tuskegee syphilis experiment. Women's prisons in LA. Also, welfare reform in 1994. Sought to sterilize women on welfare. It didn't pass, but it was it was bantied about by Republicans and <coughs> Democrats alike. So once we've dehumanized them, we ghettoize them by relegating them to the edges of our lives, to the margins of our society, to the peripheries of the planet, and to the lowest common denominator of our politics. But this <coughs> containment strategy is tantamount to making them political spectacles so we don't have to see or deal with their suffering. In addition to black male zombies, we have religious zombies. In the land where the first freedom of the Constitution is freedom of religion, Muslims are zombies. In November 2015, about an hour's drive from the University of Virginia, where I'm an Abd al Qadr fellow, something happened that highlights this actual fact. Show you a brief video here. This is Jerry Falwell Jr from Liberty University in Virginia, Lynchburg, Virginia. The name is consequential, by the way, Lynchburg. Lynchburg is about an hour south of Charlottesville, Virginia, where I now reside um, as a visiting faculty fellow. And in his chapel sermon, chapel is like a church service, Liberty is a Christian university, Students have to go to chapel every day of the week. During a chapel service, Jerry Fowell Jr. implored his students to bastardize the Second Amendment and quote, in those Muslims, before they kill us, and quote, teach them a lesson if they ever show up here. He went on to suggest free gun courses offered on campus and the ability to gain gun permits. This happened December 4th, 2014, uh, 2015, in the aftermath of the San Bernardino shootings. It just blows my mind when I see the President of the United States say that the answer to circumstances like that is more gun control. I mean, if the people... If, if some of those people in that community center and had what I've got in my back pocket right now. <laughs> is, it, is it illegal to pull it out? I don't know. Is, it, is that? <laughs> anyway. I've always thought if more, if more good people had concealed carry permits, then we could end those Muslims before they before they walk down and kill us. So, so I, just wanted to, I just wanted to take this opportunity to encourage all of you to get your permit. We offer a free course. And 
let's let, let's let's teach them a lesson if they ever show up here. So. I was reminded by a different sermon, Sermon on the Mount, to walk a mile of my neighbor's hijab. And choosing to subject myself, actually, to the same kinds of suffering and denial of civil liberties and potential bodily assault that my Muslim sister suffered was not religious sacrifice. It was embodied solidarity, placing my body among the oppressed. In this political landscape, Muslims are the political zombies to sure. So many Christians scarcely winced as a fellow Christian instigated the murder of Muslims, and instead of walking with Muslims in their distress, rather asked me why I wasn't standing with persecuted Christians in the world. With their zombie vision glasses on, these same, some of these same people go to the Church of the Nativity to see where Jesus was born, yet the fact is lost on them that the church is in Palestine, where Palestinian Christians and Muslims have no place to lay their head because there's an occupation of bodies, not just of land. Interesting how folks can see Jesus, the suffering servant's manger, yet forget that he came to suffer with oppressed humans like Muslims. Jesus' most radical act was not his lowly birth in a manger, in a cattle stall, but that he dared to see the most vulnerable of his day, women, prisoners, Children, lepers, immigrants. And in fact, in order to heal lepers, Jesus had to go out of his way to go to leper colonies, placing himself in the midst of the oppressed and oppression. So he proclaimed jubilee, jubilee on their body, jubilee on their land. How? Jesus saw people, not religious projects. He saw oppressed people and walked with them in their valleys of suffering on the way to his own valley of the shadow of death. We see political zombies, so we have a body problem, a human dignity problem, a failure to see what Hindus refer to as namaste, what people of the book refer to as the image of God, to see what we all know intuitively. Bodies matter because humans matter. Indeed, we even disembody ourselves as we fail to comprehend the inherent dignity in the other because we find ourselves in other. As an African proverb, Ubuntu says, I am because we are, and we are because I am. Even worse than ostracizing bodies to zombie land, we permit political institutions to destroy certain bodies. Police deputize to see black boys and men as zombies will shoot 16 times, cover it up, and be relatively certain that no one Either the Chicago mayor or the superintendent of police or the Cook County State's attorney will ask questions later unless the oracle, you two, prophesies. <laughs> we have to acknowledge that black bodies don't matter to understand why we don't believe that black lives matter. Trayvon Martin, a child. Tamir Rice, a child. Black boys are zombified early as problems to be managed rather than bodies to be brought back into the political community. That's why they can't breathe. We have to acknowledge that Muslim American bodies have been declared indispensable in an age when Americans broadly have accepted neo-fascist, us versus them, blowhard political rhetoric to qualify one for president. We see bodies, we see zombies, so how do we bring back the body? Embodied solidarity. Embodied solidarity is a term um, that I began using in my professional pedagogy. Um, part of what drove my wearing of the hijab um, was a kind of threefold nexus of issues. A personal concern. After what Jerry Falwell Jr. said in a chapel service, since I was teaching at a Christian university, I had two students, two, one senior, one junior, email me and say, Dr. Hawkins, we've written an, we've written an op ed to the Washington Post. <coughs> and the editors want to publish it as a story as opposed to just an opinion piece. Can you read it? So I read it. I've got, can you change, like, what should we change? I said, I have nothing to add. 
because so many white male evangelical leaders, because that's mostly who the leaders are, white and male, did not speak up against what Jerry Falwell Jr. said. So two young students from Wheaton College, Wheaton America, wrote a letter shaming the political and religious leaders of the Christian ring, saying we don't stand for hatred and bigotry because that's not what our book teaches. That's not how Jesus walked. So it was in that context that I'm teaching, but also a constant kind of professional um, lament of political scientists or people like me, scholar activists, is that we're in the class teaching about justice, which means a lot of our time is consumed in classrooms and writing papers and grading papers, which are like, don't assign them then, right? Um, <laughs> grading papers, instead of being out there. So the pedagogical challenge was how to make my classroom this space where we don't just talk about justice, but we do justice. Because theoretical solidarity, solidarity up here, is not solidarity at all. So as a professor, how can I model that? Well, a week after, or less than a week after, um, the Falwell comments, a student came to me and said, Dr. Hawkins, I want to wear the hijab home on the airplane in solidarity with my Muslim friends. She had read about um, a movement to do this in Australia many years ago. And I said, well, and she said, and I want to invite every college student I know on Facebook. And I want all of them to invite their friends. We want this to be this national movement of wearing the hijab to support our Muslim sisters. So I said, let me talk to the Council on American Islamic Relations, find out whether this is permitted, whether that would defile the hijab, is that considered haram or unclean uh, in the Muslim faith. So uh, I have a good friend who serves on the board of the council, not the board, but is a, an executive officer at the Council on American Relations in Chicago, called him up, had a conversation, he consulted with um, the staff at the office, and they said, we totally give you our blessing, we think this is amazing, in fact, we want to share this with CBS Chicago, we have contacts there, um, this is the kind of thing that we applaud, and in fact, we want to make this educational. We don't just want this to be on the news. When, you, when your students come back, we want to have a panel on campus and talk about Muslim women's experiences and these Christian college students' experiences of wearing the hijab and the kinds of things they faced at airport screen. So we were being prepped by the Council on American Islamic Relations. It was finals week, so I never heard back from my students. But I had determined that evening um, that I was going to wear the hijab not for a day, but because of my religious privilege as a Christian. It was my privilege to put on the hijab and take it off, model it to my students. And it was the season of Advent, and, and Advent is the season where Christians await the birth of, of Jesus. So it's the, the waiting of his coming. And during Advent, I thought, why not wear the hijab as an act of worship during Advent to walk in solidarity with my Muslim sisters. Um, just as Jesus came to suffer with humanity, to be in body solidarity with my Muslim sisters during this season. Um, so it's really easy as professors to neglect our high holy seasons because often, I don't, it often falls around grading times, Christmas, Passover, um, at the end of the year, um, middle of semester for, for Christians, Easter. Um, so again, it's just a way to refocus. Um, but the main priority was human solidarity. So that's just a little background. It's happening personally, professionally, pedagogically. So in body solidarity, solidarity just means suffering with. Suffering with. Suffering with involves, though, our entire bodies. That's the embodied part. Embodied solidarity is not symbolic merely because solidarity from a distance is not solidarity. This means moving toward places where injustice abounds. Because injustice is always an opportunity to stand with the oppressed. Embodied solidarity means never making peace with oppression. Embodied solidarity is not a program. It's not a public policy. It's not poverty porn. It's not a pity party. It's not religious, but it is a way of life. A call to live as an embodied question mark, always and to the death, if that's what solidarity requires. 
And body solidarity consists of four guiding questions. Number one, what and whom do you see? Our paradigm needs to shift to see suffering bodies deserving of dignity. There's no such thing as invisible injustice or opaque oppression. We don't see suffering bodies anymore because we don't want to, because we don't have to, because it's hard on the eyes. But the eyes of our hearts must be opened to see the bodies we've castigated to zombie hell because we cannot suffer with people we refuse to see. Oppression is everywhere. Do you see it? Or have you made peace with its persistence in the universe? Which groups of bodies have you written off as zombies? So second, where do you find yourself? Our position needs to be upended from our comfort zones to the proverbial and actual war zones across town or next door or across the globe. The leaders of the most successful social movements in history purposely place themselves in the precarious midst of oppression. King's Selma, Gandhi's Salt March, Mandela's South Africa, Jesus in Samaria. They didn't run from suffering bodies to plan for solidarity from the safety of bunkers. They positioned themselves in places where they could live, walk, learn from, learn from, and suffer with people whose bodies have the marks of our complicity. And they themselves were suffering, even as societal elites. This is embodied solidarity. But remember point one, you can't walk with people that you don't see yet. Theoretical solidarity is not solidarity at all. Where do you find yourself? Third, how do you approach solidarity, suffering with? Our posture needs to be realigned from capitalistic overconfidence to empty-handed humility. The United States is the land of entrepreneurs and invention because we have this innate drive to tinker with and perfect things. Embodied solidarity is counterintuitive to the American psyche, which is to outdo the world and not taking vacation. Why do we brag about not taking our vacation days? To define ourselves by what we do rather than who we are. It's countercultural because embodied solidarity requires sitting and resting in the brokenness and the bloody messes that create oppression and that perpetuate it. Not fixing things or creating band-aid programs without regard for context means our posture has to be one of just sitting in the mess. The oppressed certainly do need material liberation from their oppression. But to hear their needs requires a posture of radical embrace of the oppressed other and of ourselves. Our posture toward oppression and the oppressed can neither be presumptive as to the causes of, of suffering nor prescriptive as to the solutions. That default American position has gotten us defunct policies for centuries. Embodied solidarity requires empty hands, a mouth that confesses ignorance to the complexity of multiplicative levels of oppression layered in a double helix of suffering. A mind that says to itself constantly, I am blind and I don't know what I don't know because I can't see with the eyes of the oppressed. Ears willing to hear testimony of folks telling the truth of their oppression and resisting the temptation to explain away someone else's experience of suffering. A heart willing to be devastated by suffering. Embodied solidarity's posture is radical embrace. It precludes fear of the unknown other, because when we comprehend the depth of human dignity, that becomes the only thing. And we realize that we have everything in common. Human dignity transcends, yet affirms, our human diversity. Do you embrace others and allow yourself to be embraced and enveloped in embodied solidarity? Fourth and finally, what's your perspective? Our perspective on power needs to be reoriented toward that of privileging the oppressed in our public discourses and in our policies. A posture of empty hands precludes acting or speaking on behalf of the oppressed, but it requires privileging their perspective. The oppressed often lack political power and political resources because once zombified as subhuman and non-citizen, they are excluded from politics in the public square by definition. 
Often, they don't possess the right pedigree. They don't articulate their points in the same manner as lobbyists and lawyers. They are de facto deprived of political voice and political agency. No humanity, no rights. So what are we to do? The oppressed don't need the same elites whose policies have misrecognized their humanity to wave a misinformed policy wand. They need their voices amplified. They need their perspectives privileged by those in power who have failed to hear. That's it. To be empowered to teach us. Why? Because privileging the perspective of the oppressed unmoors us from our whitewashing of history. The lie that the US has always been committed to radical liberty and justice for all is just that, a historical fiction. A perspective of the oppressed forces us toward a realistic remembrance of history. A history where past exclusion is reified in present oppression. Our blinders are removed to consider the multiple injustices occurring on our watch, the ones that are incoherent with our realized republic. We see how we continue to legalize oppression of the oppressed. A perspective of the oppressed humanizes us and corrects our mistellings of history. A privileged perspective for the oppressed changes the calculus of our politics. It changes the assumptions. And therefore, the policy proofs will be different. For example, we would have poverty impact statements that require us to prove that our budgets are not being balanced on the backs of the most vulnerable just like we have environmental impact statements that don't allow us to build highways through forest preserves. It's really simple. So, are you willing to learn from the oppressed? Islamophobia itself is a failure to see oppressed bodies, a readiness to buy into bigoted rhetoric based on fear, us versus them politics. But we should realize that decent folks agree with exporting American citizens who happen to be Muslim. Why? Because we all hold subconscious stereotypes that can be peaked, even though most of the time we can consciously reject them in theory. The right demagogue or sycophant comes along and you find yourself swept up. That's what happened to my friends in Rwanda who committed genocide. In 2014, I visited Rwanda, exactly 20 years after the genocide began, depriving 800,000 Tutsis and others of that which is sacred, life. Hutu extremists, and just ordinary Hutus, slaughter their neighbors, even their own Tutsi relatives. For political power, yes, but also because, as one Rwandan genocidaire told me, that we were just caught up in the killing. Before Americans, and Oregonians and beavers get on their human rights high horse, remember our recent history, the country guilty of Abu Ghraib, replete with Orwellian euphemisms like enhanced interrogation techniques as justification for torture. 24 was more real than we thought. So lest we believe that we have a morally superior bone in our national body, recall that the genocide happened while we watched a Democratic president, Clinton, Republican Congress of the Contract with America, and a very aware State Department watched, well, ignored the plight of our Rwandan brothers and sisters. Clean American hands is an oxymoron. You two are complicit, better yet culpable, to the extent that we Americans did little to protest it. Some of the students were barely born, though. <laughs> I was a student at Rice University, taking, of all things, an East African history class and worrying more about what I was going to wear on Easter Sunday than the 10,000 or so bodies floating down the Kagera River toward Lake Victoria because the genocide started on Easter Day. As a college student, learning about East Africa, which is where Rwanda is, I made peace with the oppression of genocide. Fast forward to a different liberal arts college 20 years later, where I was now the professor imploring my students to never make peace with oppression, like I did, and still do. Because Rwanda happened as professors like me peered across the world from their privileged ivory towers and did nothing. The most heart-wrenching sight in Rwanda was not the underground tombs filled with shells instead of caskets 
Shells reminiscent of an archaeologist's lab, shells of bones, like skulls with pickaxes protruding from them, and femurs striped with machete marks. That was horrific, but not the most devastating. It wasn't the piles of clothes left behind by people who thought they were seeking temporary sanctuary in Catholic parishes. It was the babies. Children's blue books filled with lessons in cursive. And mostly, I'm haunted by the apparition of blood and brain matter imprinted by the crushing of a baby's skull against a brick wall of a church for being born too soon. The genocide is a pox on all our houses, but I fear we are not convinced that when any human suffers, we suffer. That an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I long to cry out, out damn spot. But first we have to see the writing on the wall, the baby's blood, and choose to live differently. To live and embody solidarity. To live and embody, there can be no condemnation of them by us, only resignation to the fact that we are genocidaires. Because we scarcely believe in human dignity. Because we have made peace with the persistence of suffering bodies so that we fail to see people of bone and marrow beyond the headlines and YouTube videos. Perhaps we don't even see ourselves because an American obsession with rights, which are baseless without a grounding in human dignity anyway. In our context, human dignity has devolved into hyper-individualistic, materialistic, political depravity. Where presidential candidates encourage violence against a young Muslim friend of mine in one breath and ridicule the disabled in the next. Because bombastic American narcissism trumps the public good, and that's our presumptive nominee in 2016 for the Republican Party. But I'm talking about human dignity, not human rights. Because human rights don't mean a damn thing if we don't believe that Rwandan babies' bodies matter. That's called human dignity. You and declarations and constitutional machinations don't free you to thrive if people see you as a zombie. Our moral and political imaginations need to recapture the centrality of human dignity to see people. As an aside, for the eight and a half years I taught at Wheaton College, I told my students in every class, if the only thing you learn from me is to see people in their suffering, that will be enough for me. We don't see people. Human dignity. Whether in Baltimore or Burundi, I am because we are. Because what the hell matters except the souls that occupy the bodies that bear the visible and invisible scars of human oppression. But we see undignified zombies, not people. This is reflected in our prejudice towards Muslim Americans and Muslims generally. Let me tell you, take you through a taxonomy of a word. The word is nigger. Colonization, American style. African Americans, those from the African diaspora. They were the real first niggers. First Nations, prairie niggers. Muslims, sand niggers. You need to know that in case you didn't. If this is offensive to you, it should be. Ethnic and religious prejudice. Most Muslims in the US are actually not of Arab descent. Also, Arab, those of Arab descent include Christians in the United States, but they're targeted too, for their names. Sikhs targeted for their turbans. So, how do we move past our zombie politics? This woman was walking down a hill toward a valley when she recognized a man walking toward her from afar. It was the man who had left her for dead on the first day of the genocide, Easter. As their bodies neared, the genocidaire tried to hide his face from her. She asked, do you remember me? He said, I don't know you. She snapped, I remember you. You speared me here and there and left me for dead. And I remember how you told me that my God died that day and that I would die too. She said, from now on, when you see me, look at me and speak to me. I am your mother. With her church blessing, she dignified his life, even though he sought to sacrifice hers on Easter Day. The eyes of her heart were bent toward human dignity, not her rights. 
she refused to blind herself to his body and freed him from the disembodiment wrought by shame and stigma. Out, damn Spock, she said. His bloody hands matter because embodied solidarity matters. The preposterous politics of our time, the political prejudice, the religious prejudice, makes me wonder, who are we? And who are we becoming? Are we human beings? Are we just human doings? And who do we want to be? Not as Americans, but as humans united by a little cave in Sturfontein, South Africa from whence we all descend. Human dignity, that's the essence of all things, and that's the essence of embodied solidarity. Thank you.